So live from Pahrump, this is Tech Talk Taco Tuesday. This is our 71st episode. Um, not really sure how we got here. Uh, it's because somebody probably told me I couldn't do a podcast. And then I went down to a Mexican restaurant on Tuesday and ate some tacos and talked about dirt bikes and dirt bike related products. And here we are. My name is Jimmy Lewis. I'm sitting here with Logan Tyler, who's been on vacation for a few weeks. Are you... you You're good. You're practiced up because this is going to be the teachable moments show. Yes. You know what teachable moments are? Where you can teach someone something. Oh, no. It's actually where you learn something because something happens. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, Same sort of thing. So I like to thank our sponsors. Uh, We do have sponsors in the show. First of all, uh, Climb. Climb makes really good motorcycle gear. Logan, what kind of gear do you wear? Not Climb. Okay, that that means you're not as good as me, right? Because like only the best guys wear climb. Uh, I I would tell you the climb gear I've been wearing, but you you would have saw it if you wouldn't have been here on the flat track on Sunday, but you missed it. I was wearing uh, the climb, the vented XC light gear, and uh, it's exactly that because it was probably about 107 degrees when we started sliding around that track, and I felt sweet in that gear. So uh, if you're wondering how to ride in the hot, and we, ha- we do have a question tonight about climb gear um, and I'll dig into it more there. What's another one of our sponsors, Logan? DDC? No, not tonight. What? No. Yeah, not tonight. <laughs> okay. What's another sponsor? He's looking around. KTM? Yeah, KTM. Imagine that. What? <laughs> uh, you had one big bit of homework on your thing, on your, yeah. on your trip. And uh, it was to memorize this read. It's uh, it's a small paragraph. I would I'll hold it up and I'll show everybody the the read on the sheet there. And so Logan, what is KTM? Um, KTM is powered by a distinct ready to race mentality. And KTM don't cheat. I see you looking at that 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 one is too. <laughs> the world's leading high performance street and off road. Motorcycle company. Manufacturer. Manufacturer. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, North American headquarters based in Marietta, California. Has to do with time. Oh, over the years, KTM has built a fierce reputation on the tracks around the world. Mm Mm-hmm. They have. Yep. Um... (laughs) <laughs> what have they had? Oh, you're oh. look. You're you're fully looking. You do you do that in school too? Do you give that eye that look over the shoulder of the person in front of you and see if you can grab that word that they spelled correctly and you missed on your spelling test? KTM has built a never done that before in my entire life. <laughs> so, what about their remarkable global success? Oh, you look at you. You're doing it again. <laughs> it's reflected in. Um. Reflected in every. M- You're not going to get a job as the KTM <laughs> announcer guy. Thing it at the Supercross produces and <laughs> everything it, and every move it makes. Okay, you you next week. Okay, this is this is where this is oh. okay. We're having teachable moment here. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna cut that out and actually you just take this one here. Take the take this one that's on this sheet. You take that home and and next week you here next week. Are you here at the show next week? Or are you, so. you going to quit? I believe I am. Okay, you're going to. You believe you're here. Or you believe you're going to quit. Believe I'm here. Okay, because I don't need any more quitters around here. <laughs> um, you're going to. You're going to read this. You're going to read it in the supercross voice. I'll help you with the voice a little <laughs> bit, but you need to hit those words like on top. So, anyways, uh, thanks to KTM. Sorry, I had to pain you through that, George, because <laughs> George gets kind of bummed out that we that we read that every time. But uh, George is a KTM rider. He's riding one of the superior products that KTM manufactures, a KTM 300 TPI two-stroke. And I'm not kidding. The other day, I was actually on the internet looking to see what one of those was going to cost me when I go pay full retail for it. And believe me, they're getting full retail for those things all day long. So nobody should think about buying one of those bikes. You just let them sit on the dealer's showroom floor so they can come down to a price that I can afford when I do this um, janky little podcast. (laughs) 
Uh, and then there's recluse. What does recluse make, Logan? Clutches for old guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They they make they make clutches for old dudes so that we can ride circles around you kids. And and basically while we're doing it, we wave at you and say, "Come on, try that little little <laughs> little guy." Because I don't have to put my hand on my clutch because I have an auto clutch, a recluse auto clutch in my bike, and it works super awesome. So if you're like Logan and you think that old guys ride recluse clutches, keep thinking that because they're they're awesome. But they make a lot of other cool components. They make a uh, oil. They make uh, regular torque drive clutches, and they have left-hand rear brakes, which is also for what I, I think they're for old guys, too, like Bob. So um, keeping on that theme, uh, that's how you get this podcast is from companies like that. So support them. Tell them you've heard about um, their stuff, and uh, tell them that they need to get send Logan more reads so he can uh, have to memorize more stuff during the week. Um, are we going to roll into the questions here? Yeah. Okay, so... So you start with the questions. You're actually you're actually a lot better than I thought you were at this. Because um, every time I, I I had Mike Shirley on last week, he was a, the guest host. Yeah. And Mike's like a big version of you. He's kind of old <laughs> and bald, and and then uh, and uh, he's he's he, he was tongue tied reading those things too. Because you know I'm not very organized. I just cut and paste them, and I don't even do a pre read. I, I give it to you to let you pre read it a little bit, but. He's, he struggled. Um, he, he said he's the second best guest host I've ever had, and he claimed that you were the first. <laughs> um, Jimmy, what is a moose? How does it work? Does it make a bike tubeless? If so, what would you have to buy a tubeless setup? This um, – oh, I didn't, I didn't uh, copy the – whoever sent me that thing. So – this is an interesting question. Here's where a lot of times on this show, um, you can you can listen and learn stuff. And maybe we're talking below your level because you've been in this sport for a long time. But I didn't even think about it. We talk about mooses like they're everybody knows what a moose is. And obviously, this person didn't know exactly what a moose was, and they actually spelled it like moose, like the animal, not moose, how they spell it in France. And so, yeah, like chocolate moose. So. I um I wanted to get a little bit of history on it, um, so I actually um, called up a friend from Michelin who I didn't get a call back from, and then I also called up Jeff Douglas from Tubeless, New Tech Tubeless. They make the Nitro Moose. Just to um, get some background, I actually wanted to call um, call Jeff on the show because he's local out here in um, in uh, or he's in California. But uh, Jeff has a very interesting time schedule, and uh, he's asleep by 6 o'clock at night. So <laughs> he does a lot of work, I guess, with uh, people in other parts of the world, and he has to have a different time schedule. So he's like, no way, I can't do that. So I'm, I'm going to – what I'd like to do is I'd like to solicit some questions about moose. If you have any moose questions, our next show, um, I'm going to do a, a, a Dirt Bike Test podcast with – with uh, Jeff and and uh, maybe Randy from Michelin just to learn a lot more about it and talk about them in depth. And then, but if you have any questions you want me to ask them or dig into that I can't answer, I will ask some S experts because um, that's what I do when I don't know something. And so anyways, a moose is, it's a foam insert that takes place of the inner tube. So you have an, most motorcycles have an air filled cavity keeps the tire expanded and on the rim. And sometimes that's a tube, a tubeless, like your tire on your car or truck. It's just the tire is a sealing mechanism that seals up against the rim and it holds air pressure inside of the tire. That's the, that's like a, um, basically a tubeless system, but there is also something called tubeless and it's spelled different, but I'll get to that in a minute. A moose is like an inner tube that's filled up with X amount pressure of air, a certain amount of air, um, but it's not air. It's it's a it's a big chunk of foam, and it's it's the density to simulate an air pressure. And it depends on there's soft ones, there's hard ones, there's ones for rally racing, and they're really mostly they were mostly designed for competition for racing uh, where you just couldn't afford to get a flat, and especially in desert racing. It was really hard to have this work because they were they. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a tough thing to accomplish. I know because I tested a lot of them uh, back in the day. So 
it's this foam insert that's it's difficult to install for most people. By the way, if you want to learn how to install them, go to dirtbiketest.com and watch one of the videos where I drink a beer and install a moose without any special tools if you want to learn how to install one. And then you can actually kind of – I don't know if you get to see it in that because I don't think I actually – I think they're actually already in the two – in in set into the tire when I go to put them on. But uh, anyways, so it's this foam insert and you put the tire on and then it – lives inside the tire for a certain life and it slowly degrades and as your tire wears out and sometimes you can depends on how hard you ride and what you do with them the moose uh, tends to get softer and softer to the point where it's no longer functional or it breaks apart or it won't hold the bead on the tire and you essentially have a flat tire so um that's what a that's what a moose is uh if you didn't know um how does it work it depends on yeah, you as a, as a rider, um, some people uh, really benefit from the moose. Like uh, most of the high level racers run them because you just don't get flats, especially when they're new, especially when they're properly installed. And it's really drifted over into trail riding where um, there, there are a lot of advantages to be able to run a moose with a very, very low pressure, uh, something like five to seven pounds where you would more than likely suffer pinch flats at a kind of, more regular basis and you have a really good traction surface that won't go flat um so there's uh, a lot of stuff like that um and the question the other question was does it make a bike tubeless in a sense it does because you don't have a, a tube any longer you're using this foam insert and that's where i'm going to get into tubeless because i think this person um saw because he said why would you have to buy a tubeless system a tubeless system is this, another interesting thing that was designed uh, by a new tech that has a, a very small inner tube. It's in, encapsulated in a in like a bladder, and it it basically it pushes out against the tire and it squeezes the tire against the rim and makes an air cavity inside of the tire, kind of like your kind of like your car truck rim does because a car truck rim doesn't have spokes going around it and and the air would leak out through the spokes and even when you see motorcycles that have tubeless they're usually um a mag type wheel but the the air um it's trapped in there the only hole is really the where the valve core goes in but on a on a normal spoked motorcycle wheel this this bladder in this tube the tube kind of rides where the spokes are and, and then this bladder over the top of it is pressed out against the tire. And so it, it essentially, you know, has a press fit in there. And uh, I've, I've run them before. I think they have some very specific uses where you can, again, run really low pressure and you're not going to pinch your tube. But if you puncture the tire, you still lose air. And there you can run um, some sealants in there, like, a, like slime or a stands. Uh, tire seal, kind of like the mountain bikes. So the mountain bikes are using very similar systems, but they don't have the crazy loads. So they're able to actually just tape their spokes and then put the sealant in there and it creates a essentially air chamber in there. So definitely much different than a moose. And I can kind of understand his confusion because we were talking about lubing up tubes <laughs> last on one of the other shows. And, and so it does get confusing. So that's how, you know, you can learn uh, a little this or a little that. Um, and if we do go over your head on this show, if there's something that confuses you, um, reach out by all means when you're, when you're, when you're listening to it or, uh, watching it on the YouTubes or in the chat room and we just kind of fly over and we say some crazy word, um, ping us, let us know, um, tell us how we can explain stuff better. Uh, that's sort of what we're here for. Right, Logan? Yes. Did you just learn anything? Yes. You did. What? Um... This is a two-way street here. You're not going to get away with just saying yes to me. You got to answer. No. How many people use them on trail rides, and how low of pressure you can get with them? Yep. And George uh, popped up in our in our chat room. So this show, if you're listening to it um, or watching it at a, in a different location on YouTube or in one of the uh, podcast formats, we do the show live on Facebook every Tuesday night at about seven o'clock when I can get my act together. And uh, we have a little chat room that runs along the side. And our buddy George uh, just posted the video of me uh, struggling with a moose. And um, I don't say hardly any bad words. 
uh, Taco Mike, who is, oh, you know, Taco Mike is a sponsor of the show, Logan. You forgot to list him off. I didn't give you the, the sheet for that, though. No. No, no. Uh, Taco Moto Co. It's right up. It's right behind us. Taco Moto dot co, not com, just co. Uh, Taco Mike actually goes in the chat room and he says, properly installed. The most important point made in any moose moose discussion. So that is true. Um, that's why you can watch that video. <laughs> so um, Jimmy Tips, the fans love him. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Does the moose insert disintegrate after a while? Um, it degrades initially and works its way towards disintegration. Um, sometimes by fire, if you do it right. Yeah, you can you can generate enough heat to light them on fire inside your tire, um, and sometimes they just start burn, you know breaking into chunks, and you get a flat tire, and then it turns into dust. So uh, depends on what you're doing with them. Um, a lot of times they just get softer and softer and softer. Uh, Craig Alberts says this is all an act. No way. <laughs> uh, Mark Daniels is eating tacos. That's good. You know. We've kind of gone away from the eating portion of this this show. Are you hungry? No. No, you're never hungry. I don't know how you do that. I'm always hungry. <laughs> um, I'm sure everybody misses out. Um, and I'd like to thank Janie, who's uh, my bartender when we have bars available in Nevada. Um, Janie helped me with the uh, sound check today because I was testing out all this new equipment. So what happened is we, we had a soundboard kind of go south and we had a Mevo a component that went a little bit south and they sort of didn't like they it was it's kind of like a moose melting essentially my i wore my moose out on this show and so i i sent a thing to mevo for tech support to ask them hey what was the this or how does that work and luckily that's how like connections work and stuff like that one of the guys who was there in tech support or someplace recognized my name and email and he said i wonder if this is this the jimmy lewis that used to put on king of the motos and and works on the rebel rally and i'm like i, I sent back to him i'm like yeah and he was like hey this is so and so and he was one of the guys that worked on the is nathan and he worked on the live show at the at the hammers and he worked on the rebel rally last year and uh, producing a live show and he's like hey I, I i totally know what you're into doing and this and that and he's like let me hook you up and i got a mevo care package with the new camera we're using tonight which is better better camera, easier connectivity, longer battery life. And, um, and then some cool things I have over here, this stand and, and some other things so I can run it through a different platform, uh, which just made this show 10% more professional, but probably 30% more likely to fail. Cause I haven't fully worked out all the details yet. So that's why you got to learn how to do this, Logan, because I just want to sit down here and just ramble, kind of <laughs> like I'm doing right now, and I need a I need a guy to come in here and handle all this stuff. You got that? Yeah. That was a lot of silence. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of silence. We're going to play with silence later. It's another theme for this show. Uh, <laughs> lots of silence. Okay, next question. Uh, but anyways, I'm going to, so if you have moose questions that, that are, uh, email them to Jimmy at dirtbiketest.com, uh, post on the, uh, on the form tonight, I'll go back through and look at it. Or when you're listening to this, um, you know, come uh, Thursday or so when we get it up on YouTubes, uh, make a comment in there and I will pass them on to experts if I can't answer those directly. Um, same guy said, I enjoy all your reviews. No, no, this is John. Just say his name. I like this part. Say his name. John Her Hurtado. John Hurtado. Got it. Um, I enjoy all of your reviews and admire your career and accomplishments. I know you're busy and will keep it brief. I'm 51 and live in southwest Florida, flat as a pancake. I've ridden street and off-road for 35 years. No bike currently. I'm going to purchase a dual sport soon, and I'm considering Husky 501s, 350s, and CRF 450L. I'm six foot four and 250 pounds. Using bike to connect street on trails, nothing gnarly fire roads. 
Sandy single track, 70% street, 30% off-road. Price not an ob object. Which bike do you recommend and what do you I need to suspension-wise for my size? Uh, you didn't mention it, but KTM 500 EXC, yeah, all day, every day. Oh, wait, you didn't mention that. Um, but KTM is a sponsor of the show, so I... I I would say that even if they weren't. <laughs> so uh, um, his 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 breakdown is Huskies 501 350s and uh, Sierra 450L. And now hearing you say that question, it actually changed. I did write him back, and but I told him I said I said because of your size, I said go with the Husky because the Honda to me it feels a little bit more cramped. But then even when I was describing the Husky at that size at 6'4", generally you're going to have to do some chassis modifications, maybe bars, maybe triple clamps, uh, foot pegs, seat. You know, it depends on how you're built. And that really depends on A, how you're built, and B, your ability level and how you want to ride. Um, so I, I kind of I said Husky, but then when, when I just saw that he said 70% street and 30% off-road... That, that actually, there's one thing that that Honda 450L does that's so much better than the KTM Husky platform is less vibration, smoother on-road operation. It's just the way it is. Um, so there, there is that. And then when you start thinking about it, if you're going to change the triple clamps, you're going to change the seat, and then you're going you're gonna to move the foot pegs a little bit or something like that. You're kind of, it, the, the difference in how cramped those two bikes are is pretty... Um, insignificant at that point uh and i've seen six four guys how, how tall is big john he's six like four. six four, six, four six, five. yeah he he rides stock hondas all day long and loves them stock bar position stock foot peg stock seat and so i you know as much as you can i would go go down to the dealership and sit on them and just see if one feels more comfortable than the other because i think in the end especially when we're talking about using this bike for 70 percent street and 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 here here's <laughs> KTM and Husky make that 701, uh, five, 701 and the this KTM 690 and the KTM 701, where if you're going set, if you're looking for a single cylinder bike and you're going that much on the street, that bike starts getting appealing at that point to me, uh, in in my world. If that makes any sense, that's a bike I never ever ever recommend. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, uh, yeah, it is. Is this the first, it's probably the first time. Yeah. So, so Berm can and Mark is like right now turning over in front of his computer, just doing flips. I don't want to say it's a grave, but anytime we sit in front of the computer, it's like being in the grave. <laughs> uh, so yeah, John, um, uh, give that a shot. Um, and go sit and, and then this, I think the 701 690 platform is actually a little bit comfortable for a larger rider um, as well. So take that for what it's worth. You can't, you can't, you can't buy my opinion. It just flows out easily. What's the next one? Um, RK rack rack. <laughs> it's the rat R dash ack rack. Um, at the 30, the mystery system is the mechanical anti squat. Check out Fort Nine review of the this bike for details on that. So he's talking about the the Tenere review that we did, and then the last uh, two two Tech Talk Taco Tuesday shows ago, where we got into the whole anti squat. Oh yeah, I gave you some uh, reading buffing materials on that right up there. You see those diagrams and stuff. You need to memorize those formulas and. Get that all in check. Um, <laughs> so he he, say, he says that in th at thirty seconds into the video, you can see the anti squat working. Is that what he he or three thirty into the video, you can see the anti squat working. We discussed this at length uh, in our previous shows. Um, Logan, do you want to explain how uh, chain torque affects the uh, stability and uh, traction of the motorcycle right now? Um. Logan, this is a audio show, and we are waiting for your response. Um, <laughs> depending on the chain tension, it can affect the like s s forces on the swing arm. That's it. Yes, that, that's it. Yeah, and and so it's funny because another another guy who gets like hundred times, no, maybe even thousand times more views than we do. 
um, said that that the Yamaha was built with anti anti squat, and that's what le- leads to its stability. And I saw that, and um, I did backflips in front of my. I turned over in front of my computer <laughs> when I saw that. I was like, I was like, man. Even in, I mean, that's that's a that's a really good selling point. If you that that bike has that character, you should have rode it. But you're a little small. Um, it has it has the the engine character is so good. It's so smooth and so torquey. It just gets really good traction and it handles good. And it's there there might be like two percent of that might be the swing arm pivot to counter shaft position i'm i'm going out on a limb saying two percent but that's not the reason for it. it's the engine character and it's just the overall it's the weight bias of the bike and all kinds of stuff mostly engine character this is why that bike gets good traction and we're gonna have some questions about this don't try to memorize those formulas now you'll fry your brain yes <laughs> so that, that that guy is probably a doctorate in physics that wrote those um those things so we got into this discussion and talked about it, and I'm I'm in disagreement. But it's funny how many people come back and they they trip over our video after watching his video, and then they try to tell me that uh, that's the reason for it. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I I rode it a whole bunch, and I know what it feels like. I've ridden by, and we talked about it in the other shows. If you're really interested in that topic, go back and listen to ex- episode 69 or 68 a little bit and 69 incomplete because we go off the deep end on that. Wouldn't you say, Bob? Yeah. You were here. Yeah. Yeah, it was a deep end. Go like this. Yeah. 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 So uh, we wrote, we, I've ridden a lot of bikes that have different uh, characteristics that uh, are, are like that. So next question. It's on our, uh, our KTM 390 in our Tech Talk show. Um, or there's a different one. I think there's a different one. Okay. Arganetti Sandoval. Centrifugal, what the? Centri- <laughs> Centrifugal. Centrifugal clutch. clutch. So he, he's he's commenting on our uh, Recluse uh, video. By the way, Recluse, a uh, big sponsor of Tech Talk Taco Tuesday. It's for old people, right, Logan? <laughs> that's what you said. That's not what I said. Um, that's what people told me, but they didn't realize how young I was when they told me that and um, how old they were, and now they're all riding with recluses. So... Uh, he called the re- the recluse a centrifugal clutch, and essentially that's what it is. That's what the auto clutch portion works, because that's how you make an auto clutch work, is centrifugal forces acting upon some discs that engage the clutch for you. So you can, I like to wave at people when I'm riding past them with my recluse clutch as they're stuck on the side of a hill. Because I don't have to do anything with this hand, I can just wave. Wait. Is that the, no, the throttle hands. Yeah, that's the right hand. I got it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Next question. KTM 390, the Tech Talk Taco Tuesday show. Galant, Galusi. Uh, <laughs> here we go. It's name that name <laughs> on Tech Talk Taco Tuesday. Let me try. Uh... Uh, Gia, Gia Luciana J- Jabinelli, Jab, Jab, Jabel. Is that it? You try. Come on. You just take stabs at it. We'll get it. Gia, G- Gina, Lu- <laughs> Gina Lucy, J- Jabinelli. Okay, go ahead. Question. Um, thanks. I've seen the whole show. I've been thinking of converting a 390 adventure to spoked 2918 wheels thanks for i've seen the whole show oh wheels for my wife though i've i know that ktm is going to come out with spoke 1917 wheels apart from the needed technical adjustment would you recommend it so he's actually it's kind of funny because apart from the needed technical adjustments i think I, i i hope he's talking about as well as the fender, the front fender would have to be altered, and maybe you'd have to like lengthen the chain to, to, to based on the size of the wheels going up. Um, he's right. KTM through their hard parts catalog, I'm pretty sure is going to do a 1719 spoked wheels. We actually ha- got our hands on some. Are you gonna t- Are you gonna Instagram that photo you just took? I was are gonna you- memorize it or like 
Are you Look gonna ins- put it on your Instagram account? You can follow Logan at uh, what is it, Logity seventy <laughs> three? Yeah, he posts like seven things. Never. Never. Yeah, you, everybody wants you to post. I put your tag on the thing, on the show. You should put that. You should tag, put that on Instagram right now and see how many followers you get. You're I gonna... I lost my Instagram account. It oh. got hacked. Oh oh. So I had to change the password, and now it won't let me back in. Really? Yeah. You are a huge nerd. <laughs> okay. Um, that's okay. Well, let's get a new one and let's let's promote it. They're free. <laughs> yeah, they're free. Yeah, you don't have to pay for it. And just in between the cartoons when they're playing commercials, you get that Instagram account rolling, and we'll put some good tech info, and then you'll have all these nerds hanging out and wanting to know more information. Uh, back to the KTM wheel. Sorry for the distraction. <laughs> um, yeah, so we got our hands on some smart pin or vilt pin. Husqvarna makes that. That's that. It's that kind of street. It's that. It's a, it's the street bike for hipsters. Bike, yeah. yeah, it's it's a, it's like an urban bike, and one of them has spoked wheels, and that's the same sized um, axle and wheel spacing and everything. So we have them at W Wheels right now. They're lacing up some 16 and 19s for us, so we're going to have that and we're going to try it. And our next step is after we do that, if it if it works out, um, you know, that'll just be more for a little bit of durability and to 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 run, uh, you know better maybe better tires on the bike we were going to try 1821s but from my experience in doing that it does change the handling of the motorcycle i did this a lot with a bmw gs 1200 there were some companies like woody's wheel works was kind of the originators in doing this they started making these 1821 conversions and it it you had to change both and here's where it was funny because a lot of riders would only change the front. They'd go to the 21 inch front because it made a difference, but then they'd leave the 17 rear and the bike just did not handle as well as it did when, because the 18 got a little bit more narrow and a little bit taller and it kind of brought the bike around. So just be warned that when you start doing big changes to something like wheels, um, it will affect the handling. Uh, I think, I don't know, even just going to a, from a, from a, a mag wheel, uh, to a spoke, to, you know, rims uh, or, or spokes uh, will change the way that the bike feels and reacts uh, in my uh, impression. Not a ton, maybe maybe that 2%, kind of like anti-squat, but it will change it. <laughs> what does Darren Jones want to know? Oh, wait. Oh, we, we, we lost this question, didn't we? There's no question for him? Yeah. Or, no, which one are we at? Jonah Alexander. Yes. MC Dougal Gardner. Is that his whole name? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, he's, ta- he's, he's commenting on, the, we must have commented on the KTM 390 because he's, he's got a question for us there. Um, next to the KTM Adventure 450 replica, why even produce this bike? The 390 Duke is getting amazing reviews and joy from riders. This doesn't feel good enough for street or trail. Odd for KTM. So he's comparing. <laughs> Here's, hey, you sent the question. I'm going to answer it. Uh, he's comparing the uh, KTM 390 to the uh, 450RR, which is the rally replica bike that you can only buy if you have an entry to Dakar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so... And, and yeah, there's probably a $33,000 difference in price, you know, from because I think you have to kind of buy a spare parts kit with that rally replica bike as well. So not only do you have to be one of the best rally riders in the world to get your hands on a 450RR, there's a $30,000 price difference between the two bikes you just compared. Uh, Jonah Alexander, MC Dougal Gardner, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um I, I didn't look at his. I sometimes when I when I get questions like this, I have to go see who's asking them, uh, just because I want to know, and uh, I want to see where they're coming from. And so that there's, there's just two different, completely different things. One is designed for entry level, and I'm going to get in trouble for saying entry level and or beginner or new riders. Um, and one is designed for someone to go race the hardest rally in the world. They're not the same things. And the 390 Duke is a really good bike for 
an entry level, you know, want to get into that stuff. It, in in certain world markets with licensing restrictions and stuff, that's the baddest ass bike you can get your hands on. It's it's just different. The 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 that bike that they built, the three ninety adventure, and I'll stand by this all day long, is a really, really good platform for people that are looking for a small displacement adventure bike that's capable. It's not a ten ninety or twelve ninety or a seven ninety. It's it is what it is. It's a stepping stone and it's not anywhere near a four fifty rally replica. Although to his credit, KTM in their marketing materials does say that the frame is derived <laughs> <laughs> from the 450 RR, and I said, "Well, basically, they both motorcycles have a frame." An yeah, and it says that they both have a frame, and one. And I think they kind of have a trellis type design. So, so, th- but if you set them next to each other, yeah, don't even do it. So, okay, <laughs> next question. Um, Mark Lewis, surely speed limits in the U.S. are maximum 70 miles per hour. This bike can do nearly 100 miles per hour. So why could you not ride all day on the freeway with no problem? I think he's also talking about the KTM 390. Uh, it does 90, what do we get, 96, 93 out of it. Um, you can do freeway speeds all day on this motorcycle, no problem. But it's you're, you're, you're wringing its neck. And not that the bike can't handle it, and not that it's hard on the motorcycle, uh, it's they're they're designed to do that, but it's just it can do it. It's just you're kind of wringing its neck. But why, why would you want to ride it at seventy miles an hour, or eighty miles an hour, or ninety miles an hour on the freeway? Anyways, it's that's not if if you want to do that, there's better bikes for doing that. It can do it when needed. Um, and the difference is when you start talking about like, okay, I've got a three ninety, and my buddy has a seven ninety. When you're going seventy miles an hour down the highway behind a truck. And you want to pass it, and you pull out and pass it. On the larger displacement, higher horsepower bikes, you pull out, zip past it, and you're done. On the 390, you might have to take a run at it, and it'll take a little while. Just like if you're in a, what's a cheap, small car that doesn't have a lot of, a du chevaux? No. No? No. Uh, oh, a Yugo? No, they don't make those anymore either. They don't. Oh, what does Nate, Crazy Nate drive? He drives, the, what's that little three-cylinder? The, the Saturn... No, the, oh, the, the, shoving, the, the, the the little tiny car, oh. the clown car, the the three cylinder thing. Yeah, I don't. The Chevy. Chevy, Chevy Spark. Spark. Shark. Yeah, the Spark. Shark. He had a Spark. Yeah, you have to hyper mile on the thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh yeah, good times. Um, it's the Chevy Spark of adventure motorcycles. Just take. It's a capable vehicle. It can get you where you need to go. It does what it does. That's probably not an ad slogan, and KTM's probably going to pull my advertising for saying that. So go ahead. Next question. Um, I believe this, Mark Lewis, I love this review. One difference I have with you, 33.7 inch seat height does not matter. You said you're six foot, I'm six, seven, with shoulder Legs compared... If he thinks I said I'm six foot, he doesn't listen. (laughs) Keep going. Compared to my torso. Shorter legs compared to my torso. Basically a 29-inch inseam in jeans. I've got him beat by an inch. I can tippy-toe a 34-inch bike on level ground. What if I need to stop on sloped ground when off... Road. The factory KTM lower kit only lowers one inch. As a 57 year old that rode dirt bikes until till 17. He's only 51. Quit trying to add ages on us old guys. <laughs> You're mean. I'm wanting to get back into the sport. Not being comfortable isn't going to bring me back in. This KTM looks perfect, but I may have to go with a lesser bike. There may be some aftermarket solutions that show up. Um, you know, I, now I just look at the chart. I think I think I mixed up the names on who. I think this is Darren Jones's question. So the um, so I'm I'm five nine and three quarters on a good day, um, and I have a thirty inch inseam, and I can plant both feet on the ground on the KTM three ninety very easily. Although every time I put both feet on the ground, 
I feel like I'm going to crash. You know why, Logan? It's out of control. Right. Um, this is where this is. Oh, this is a Jimmy advice. This is a Jimmy tip. If you're putting both feet on the ground at any time on your motorcycle, you have no idea which side you're going to crash to. I saw Bob when we were riding over to the flat track. When we went through the gate, I saw you throw the rudders out. I'm like, Bob, what are you doing? Like, which side of the fence do you want to hit? I, I, that's what, when, when the both feet come out, a good rider only puts one foot down, one or the other, one or the other. The brakes didn't work. The brakes didn't work. Wow. Good excuse. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a good excuse. Um, so you were going to, so you were using your feet to drag on the ground. Cause once you took your feet off the foot pegs, you've lost control of the motorcycle because you no longer have control of the rear brake. You have that nice front brake that's actually used for braking on the front, but, um, uh, this section, uh, this uh, portion of the show is brought to you by Jimmy Lewis Off-Road Training, where we will be releasing our uh, new fall schedule and classes upcoming in Washington State uh, in our next newsletter. So subscribe at www.jimmylewisoffroad.com. I slipped that in there pretty smooth, huh, Logan? Yes. Um, so I always say if, if you really want to put both feet on the ground – and you want to feel comfortable, that's fine, but you're going to compromise so much in your motorcycle setup if you're limiting yourself by seat height because even shorter people can always slide their butt off to the side of the seat just a little bit and put one foot down. Another thing I pointed out about the KTM 390 in particular is the seat is actually very narrow right up the gas tank, and then it kind of starts getting wider for comfort. So when your butt's on the seat, there's a little bit bigger of a pad for you, but Another thing that we notice a lot is that novice riders tend to sit in the back or the middle of the seat. They, they, it's like there's an alien inside of the gas tank and they don't want to get close to it. So they sit. You, you see this all the time, right? Yes. They won't scoot forward. And so when you're on this bike, if you're sitting back and you try to put your feet down, the wedge of the seat doesn't allow your, you know, they, your legs get forced out as opposed to going straight down. And it makes the seat height feel taller than it is. And, uh, I think, as Bob mentioned when he helped me write the review of this bike, because uh, I can't write very well, um, the seat height is probably quoted with the spring preload completely reduced. So, And I think they actually del- deliver the bikes like that so it meets that criteria. Because I crank the spring preload way up on that bike and most adventure bikes in general. Because seat height is such a big concern in showrooms. When people go in there, they want to put both their feet on the ground and they feel like they're going to tip over. And you don't want to tip over in the motorcycle showroom because you do the Domino's thing and you knock over every bike in the showroom. Big problem. And then you feel like I shouldn't get into motorcycles. And he's acting, he's actually asking and he's got a really good point there. It's like he, he feels like he's, you know, he wants to get back into it, but he probably doesn't want to crash or get hurt or be intimidated by falling over. And um, so... I always tell people, don't let the seat height intimidate you. Teach yourself to get one foot down, you know, get off the side of the motorcycle and put a foot down. And it's really not that bad. And as you practice it and make it more instinctive, uh, it really does. It really does work. So uh, I wouldn't, I would never lower that bike. That bike's already low enough. I would ne- <laughs> you're, you're tiny and you ride it all day long. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to actually, you're growing. That's <laughs> you look like three inches taller since the last time you left here. So uh, um, don't, I always say this, don't let seat height be the big determining factor. Um, you know, when mo- we don't ride with our feet on the ground. That's the other thing I always like to point out. If you're riding with your feet on your ground, you're not really riding your motorcycle. So uh, take that for what it's worth. Um, sorry <laughs> in advance, uh, Darren or Mark, whoever wrote that question. Next question. Um, Christian. Delgado. Very good and very com- compressive review. Seat- comprehensive. Comprehensive. Seat heights is also my concern. I'm 5'5", five five, typical Asian size. Well, he said it, not us. Christian Delgado. That's the most Asian name that we've said all night, and we said it without, like, really stumbling, didn't we? Yeah. Good job. Um so at 5'5", five five, <laughs> now we're getting down there. <laughs> we're not 5'7", now we're 5'5", five five, and we're still complaining about the seat. It's like an ongoing thing. Erica, how tall are you? 5'2". Five two, five five two. Have you sat on the KTM 390 out there yet? Yeah, actually I did. Yeah. yeah. Can you get feet on the ground? I, one of them I wasn't. I, I yeah. never have. 
You never you never went for the two foot thing. So okay, five five. I'm still gonna say you can you, you should should be okay. <laughs> you're you're okay. I but again, this is the this is the thing. And um, uh, you know, I I have this writing school that'll help you actually. When we get our online writing school going, I didn't say that out loud, but we, you know, then we'll have these drills and techniques that you can use and it'll, it'll be worth the, you know, couple bucks you have to spend to make your motorcycle riding uh, techniques even better. Who's next? Um, Abo Diff. Abo Diff. The best review of KTM Adventure ever. Thing. Thank you. Guys, so much. And I already have one, and I'm ready. I'm already happy with it. Could you please tell me the tire you put on it, and is it good on road as well? Logan, well, what 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 grade are you going to give him for his uh his uh punctuation and capitalization? There was two punctuations. Should have been like. So was that a is that a C? C. Okay, because we're going to do some grading later. So I just wanted to. Just check out the C C on the punctuation. Great. I, I'm going to go with D. I'm a little harder. <laughs> hey, thanks for the comments, Abadif. Uh, the tires we used were Kenda Big Blocks. Um, those are what I use on all of my adventure bikes. I have to say that Kenda does support our schools and help us out with uh, with my on uh, off road riding schools. So, yeah. Um, Good tires for on road, off road, mostly off road, but they're they're plenty fine on road as well. Next question. The KTM three hundred and fifty. One thirsty one. I'm not bragging. I'm stupid or lazy, but I had a DRZ four hundred SM for eight years, and I never even opened the valve cover. Never ch- checked the valves anything i also have a 16 fc 350 and a 16 yz 250f same thing never checked the valves so far they've been flawless four strokes in my world are almost maintenance free except for oil air filter and chain loop again i'm really lazy lol oh well (laughs) So you're like ninety uh, percent of motorcycle riders. I he he he's starting to sound like uh, um, he feels like he's and not normal. And I think what he's doing is way way more normal than what everybody that's on the internet pounding keys talking about. You know, worried mostly worried about valve adjustment intervals and you know when they have to replace the top ends and stuff like that. So he's just like us. I mean, that's the way I treat my bikes. I change the oil, keep the air filter clean, ride them until they start doing something funny. And then um, I then I ask myself, if it does something funny, I go, what did I just do to it or what's going wrong? And uh, and work from there. So uh, what, was his na- what was his name again? It was... Oh, oh it's on the other page. Yeah. 151? 131? 131. Yeah, you uh. should, should put your names on it so I, you know, then we can mispronounce your real name, not your stage name. But no, I think that's I think that's completely um um I think it's normal. And here's where I'm going to go on a little bit of a of a rant <laughs> that when, you know, if you if you take your bike and you everybody's so there's like a there's like a disease now. It's like you feel inferior if you don't go and modify your bike. Like you, you buy something that's stock, and if you don't go and modify it, you're less of a man or a woman. Uh, you know, if you don't modify your KTM dual sport bike or your whatever, and and you you don't necessarily need to. I there was a quote the other day that somebody posted that said uh, to the effect that most people that are worried about modifying their bike um, never use the power that their bike has. <laughs> and and I went to the say it's like they they've never experienced the the full throttle of the the bike. I mean, like use it and then start you know tune it to to that ex- expanse. But the same thing is when they start doing all these modifications, then like, well, what about the durability and what about this and what about that? Well, you just threw all that out the window for the most part. Uh, 
because generally the problem you're going to have that now you will run to the keyboard and start telling everybody about is related to whatever you modified and then something's different and you probably didn't need to in the first place, but uh, yeah, makes sense? Yes. Yeah? Okay. He also said, Jimmy, about modding your new bike. Yeah. Well, that's what I was just talking okay. about. Yeah. Um, but he's he's got a DRZ 400, which are relatively, I mean, that's one of the more delicate of the um, dual sport bikes out there, just in in being a Suzuki. And th there's certain Suzukis that are just absolutely bulletproof. And then there's always the Suzuki that, you know, my experience, I have a few of them. They just break something randomly for no reason. It's never the same thing. It's like the frame cracks on one at this spot and you'll never see it again in another bike or a, a bolt snaps inside the case and it leaks oil and you'll never see it. I have two of this. I have two DRZ 250s and they both, they run pretty good 99% of the time, but then like one little thing will break and I'll never see it again. I'll talk to other people on the bikes. They've never seen it before. And that's the way the DRZ 400 was. I had one for a while. Um, I, I really liked it because at the time it was an electric start bike and the XR400 was not, and my XR400 would never break, but I would rather push a button to make it start, kind of like the TTR125 I ride. Yeah. I like pushing the button, so I was willing to deal with, okay, maybe every once in a while it would break. And then my DRZ400 would like, an intake valve would all of a sudden get tight for no particular reason. You talk to other people, it's like, no, that's not normal at all. It's like, yeah, usually it's the left exhaust valve. And then you talk to another guy, it's no, the ring brakes. And then another guy says, oh, my output shaft bolt backed off and ground a hole in the case. Never the same thing. So if you're, you know, and then he's talking about having his Husky, his 16 FC, and those are Husky, and he has a Yamaha. The Huskies and the Yamahas and the Hondas, in my experience, are just pretty damn bulletproof. And if you change the oil, all bikes, if you change the oil, keep the air filter clean, don't run them on the rev limiter, don't do downshifts at high RPM when it runs it into the rev limiter and you can't do anything about it, uh, you're not going to have a problem with your motorcycle. There might be some little sort of weak links or characteristics. You know, some bikes have clutches that are a little more susceptible to things, um, but you're going to be fine. Um, on the Tenere video, X935R just started looking into adventure biking, and I'm my mid-50s. I was wondering if I missed the train on those bikes. I'm gray and the goth, but you're not doing... You're not going to catch me in a skateboard shop either. You want to answer his question, Logan? What do you think? <laughs> Get started in adventure biking. It's fun. Yep. What do you think you should do? Well, he's scared of skateboards. Oh. <laughs> That's what that means. Yeah, yeah. He's scared of skateboards. Um they're not like skateboards. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the other thing. Is, is is like I'm sitting here staring at this like small little glass of tequila here, and you know how how, how I get to have that. Yeah. You start talking. What? Yeah, you have to answer the question. Oh. Um. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's not like a skateboard. That's the answer to the question, right? Yes. Just get on the damn bike and ride it. Yeah. Get a KTM three ninety. Yes. If you're afraid of the 790, 700, 7, 10 by 700. Uh, yeah, and then you can work your way up. Uh, there's lots of options for that. Next. He also said, these bikes are cool, though. <laughs> then you should just buy one. Like, it didn't stop anybody else. Yeah. Ron Harthel. How does this compare to the 2019, 2020... KTM 690 Enduro R. Oh, no comparison. Yeah. I mean, 690 Enduro R, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> Wait, um, I did that already on this show. Right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so you're going between a single cylinder and a twin cylinder. Um, the uh, It's funny because you can tell when some people get hung up on displacement. That, that So 690 and 700 are the same. 701, and which is the Husky version. 701 and 700, it's the same. But... 
those two bikes, even though they're both labeled as adventure bikes, probably could not be more different. And I know which one I would pick. You want to guess, Logan? Between the Tenere or the KTM and Husky? Yeah. Probably Tenere. Right. Yeah. Okay, next. He also said price, wind, handling, weight, power, liability, and off on road. Lugability. Lugability. Oh. Yeah. It's a liability me talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> Yamaha should come on and sponsor the show. I got a call with them pretty soon. Um uh, price, I think they're kind of the same. So, uh, Yamaha wins. Uh, wind. No question Yamaha wins because it actually has a fairing. Uh, handling. No question Yamaha wins. Uh, I'm not a fan of the handling of the, of the, the 690 Enduro because I don't know what it's supposed to handle for. It's not bad. I mean, it's, it's, it's an okay bike. It's just not great at anything. Um, weight. Uh, I don't know the weight of the KTM 690, but the Yamaha feels lighter, in my opinion, believe it or not. Uh, power. I like twin cylinder power uh, almost every time over single cylinder power. Just, uh, man, if Husaberg would have made a twin cylinder bike. Yeah. Imagine a 570 and a 570 stuck together <laughs> like this. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, there's some actually some companies where Husaberg guys drifted off to that made motors like that, and I got to ride them, and they're pretty good. Uh, lugability. They both lug pretty good, because that KTM 690 motor is a really good single-cylinder motor. And uh, off on road. Uh, that's everything, and I would just take the Yamaha. Next question. Um... La, Lila, Martin. <laughs> Leia. Leia. Leia Martin. Martin. Stock bash plate. I dropped the bash plate into a swamp hidden in long grass at about five miles per hour, and the swamp smashed the bash plate, which cracked the swamp right at the drain the sump. plug. The sump. The sump. Yep. Right at the drain pl plug. If you are riding off-road, the stock bash plate is not as strong as it looks. He's talking about the Tenere 700? Yes. And uh, the bash plate does not look strong, and I agree with his statement. <laughs> it doesn't look strong, and it's not as strong as it looks. So, therefore, uh, don't bash it into stuff. It's. I think it's more of a, a bug deflector. Um, and like for a little gravel that fl flies up or off your front tire, that's what that plate is designed for. I'm sure the aftermarket's going to take care of it. Man, I'm bummed out that he smashed his sump. You know what a sump is, Logan? Do you know what a cesspool is? Lost me there. Oh. <laughs> so teachable moment here. So a sump is it's the it's the cavity where the oil it's the engine sump it's the yeah. cavity where the oil hangs out down at the bottom of the motor when it's not being used. Okay. And there's an oil pump in there and it sucks the oil out of the sump and then sprays it all over the motor wherever it needs to go through passages and stuff like that. That's what the sump is. And so when you drain it usually you're draining the the sump of oil unless there's a in a in a and uh, that's a wet sump motor and they have also called a dry sump motor and that one sucks all of the oil out of the engine cavity the sump and stores it in an oil tank someplace else and then s spins it around and lubricates it and the, the difference is well most of the time now they they actually the sump is actually separate from the crankcase so they try to keep the oil out of the crankcase so they don't want the crank spinning through that oil because it reduces power and it makes a big splashy mess so um, that's what a sump is. And he, he broke it off at the, uh, basically he snapped his drain plug and probably caused a little bit of leak, but they make this stuff called JB weld for that. And I can show you how to use that. I'm good at it. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> Zippo Dippo. <laughs> oh yeah. Zippo Dippo. This review gave me a headache. That's American <laughs> for you. They can't wait to shut up. 
they can't listen and they'll talk to you to death. I notice Americans have strong jaw lines, such stronger than most people. The coes that yeah. that coes every dialogue turns into a talking contest. That oh yeah. <laughs> I want more torque, not talk. Ooh, yeah. Um, <laughs> are we? Ta- is this a motorcycle talk show? Yes. Yes. Okay. We'll just get into this a little bit. Um, he's talking about the Tenere Seven Hundred interview um, with where me and Heather. Um, well, actually, most people just complain about that. I you know keep cutting her off, don't let her talk, and put thoughts in her head. But like usual, wait. This whole show is me just jabbering. Well, the, the I Tenere- I can't shut up when I talk on this show. And I, I'm talking you to death. So um, <laughs> I wonder what, how many followers Zippo Dippo has on his, <laughs> on his uh, YouTube account or wherever he <laughs> found us. Um, our strong jawlines are sexy and uh, appealed to all over the world. You should uh, work that jaw muscles <laughs> when you need it. Uh, um, want more torque and not talk. Um yeah, I, I actually I'm trying to perfect the uh, the talkless uh, bike review. It's where I just stand around and I'm going to start flexing my muscles <laughs> and have awesome videos of me just like riding over stuff. And by that, I hope that you you know see how well the bike works and you can read my mind so I don't have to talk. How am I supposed to do it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, what to. To work out my uh, to talk to people and tell them how get more muscles. The more muscles. Uh, no, he, he he likes my strong jawline. I think Heather's too because Heather was in that video, but I didn't let her talk much. So, uh, hey Zippo Dippo, thanks for the <laughs> thanks for the comment. Uh, t- please tell me how we can do less talking, more better videos. Maybe get like the Jimmy uh, the in your pocket thing. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, follow me on Instagram. Uh, follow Dirt Bike Test on Instagram where we have a segment called I've Got You in My Pocket where I do a lot less talking. I let the motorcycle talk to you. It's great video content. Next. <laughs> Scott C. Great riding and great riding shots. Otherwise, and I'm sorry to say, but you control your wife's ideas without significant merp. Here we go. Too keep, often. Keep going. <laughs> they cling, cling, cling with me, and so you're difficult to watch. Now I'm difficult to listen to and difficult to watch. You're so a uh, I'm a what? A sexist. A sexist. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, she, she should be thankful because I gave her her shoes that day so she could come out of the house. And then I let her talk on video, and that's like pretty – that's – Nice, right? Oh, what? You should tell your listeners that Heather is an expert witness at trials and knows how to talk. I know she knows how to talk. I, I, what I pointed out to this guy, I did respond to this guy. I, I told him, I said, you should see what like the rest of the day is like. <laughs> like when I try to talk about science and I just get shut down. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's good. I, I have to, I only videotape the arenas where I'm, uh, you know, uh, doing good in. Next question. A rogue NW. A roke? I'm trying to determine how important traction control is and if it is a significant safety feature. Did the riders ever miss traction control on the T70 700 or feel like the lack of it compromised the safety of the bike? Mm, uh, should we talk about um, anti squat? How <laughs> anti squat made that bike work better? <laughs> <laughs> Our riders never ever missed the traction control on the Tenere 700. That bike has traction control built into the motor power delivery character. I don't know how I could be any more clear about that. Heather, when the very first time she actually ran into a situation where any other bike with traction control would it, it, it where it would have activated, and she said, "I really like the traction control on this bike. That's how good it is." And then he asks if it if it was a safety feature, right? like is a significant safety feature. And here's where I'm kind of torn because coming from – how many motorcycles have you really ridden with traction control? I mean, not many. 
Not many at all. Yeah. So, and I was the same way. I, I grew up never riding a motorcycle with traction control. Traction control was my wrist. It's what I do with my wrist. But then we always have to take it back to like, okay, somebody might be just brand new getting into this. They've the only driven vehicles, whether it's, you know, their street, their street vehicles or whatever that have traction control built in and you start expecting it to work. Um, so m- my kind of paradigm in that is if you, if you have to turn it on or click it or adjust it, you have to at least have enough time to go out and test it to learn, okay, I like this level of traction control. And then you make sure that when you turn your bike on, that that's the level of traction control you get. Because there are times when if you turn the key off, it goes back to maximum traction control or you have to turn it on or off. And sometimes I'm riding around and I forgot that I shut the bike off and I go up to something and and I do something with the throttle and I know that it's going to spin a little bit, but I know that it's going to you know grab traction and do what I want. And traction control kicks in and I don't get the burst of power that I want and bad things start to happen. So anytime in my world when electronic stuff starts taking over, I, I don't 100% trust it. I don't think it's that good just yet to where it can anticipate what you know my years of experience and understanding do. But then you come to pull back to a novice rider that may start relying on this because they're not that good with the throttle and their throttle is, has two positions. It's on or off. It's like imagine trying to ride your motorcycle and instead of a throttle, you have a switch on or off. Believe it or not, some people ride like that. That's just the way that they operate the throttle. And and they don't know one-third throttle, two-third throttle. They don't even know full throttle and half throttle. It's just like on or off. And we see this all the time. So someone can hop on some of these bikes with really good traction controls and ride the throttle like an on-off switch. And in doing that, the motorcycle takes over and it does a lot better than they would. Yeah. So in other words... the. It, it actually does some, and especially now with butterfly valve control as opposed to ignition cut, it actually enables the motorcycle to work pretty good, even though they're really ham-fisted. But that rider never learns whether that's the right way or the wrong way to do it. Well, maybe that rider, all of a sudden, somebody says, oh, you're riding with traction control? You should turn it off. Whole different riding experience uh, rears its ugly head at, at that point. But you can't do that on your YZ105 on or off. No. <laughs> because it does one one or thing it goes it goes slow or it flips yeah, yeah. right <laughs> so um don't get worried too much about traction control um it's that uh, and if you do have a bike with traction control you you owe it to yourself to go play with it and find out what the different modes because some of those modes are really really good and other ones just don't work for you based on the way that you ride and uh so, and if you, but it, the problem is if you don't know how you ride until you actually go play with it and take the time to learn it, it's hard for you to even understand how good or beneficial it is. And if you're, if you're kind of asking that question and really worried about traction control, I would lean you more towards a bike with it because, you know, maybe that would be a, a, a really beneficial tool for you to, you know, use and grow with as a rider. Next. Lots of questions now, huh? Yeah. Yeah. This is on the gas gas. Charles yeah. bike. Um, Charles H. Clickbait. Oh, he said that, huh? He said that video is clickbait. <laughs> you you want to know why? Because it says Taddy Blazusiak's, um new ride, which is, that's true. There's nothing untrue about that. But there's nothing about Taddy Blazusiak in our in our video. You know, it's funny, Charles H. I said the same thing to the guy that made the video, Scott Hoffman. <laughs> I said that's kind of a clickbaity title. You're you're getting on the YouTube train. Hey, you know the best thing about that clickbait, click, clickbait video on our YouTube channel is um, you get to watch an ad before you get to watch the video because he hit the monetization button on it too. So uh, yeah, next question. Um. Motor Moto Ventures. Motorcycle and dirt bike training. Right. Publicly subscribe to you. Right. For one week. Right. What do they say? Thanks, Scott. <laughs> it's not clickbait. <laughs> there's hardly even you know, there's hard you know. No, uh, Moto Ventures is another off road riding school and um Andre uh 
is the guy who's doing the writing in the video and they do trials training and stuff like that. And so there was a definitely a cooperation with us and them uh, to get that video. Cause if you watched me ride that trials bike, you'd just see it crashing and horrible technique. It'd be watching, it'd be like watching a guy who needs traction control uh, ride a trials bike and trials bikes, especially that gas gas 300 does not have it. I have a little bit of balance, but I have probably quite possibly one of the worst trials bike riding styles known to man. Uh, I want to put my feet down, and when I start putting a foot, well, usually just a foot, I like dabbing, which gets you a lot of points in trials. And believe me, in trials, you don't want points. I get those. And then and then usually when start, stuff starts going wrong, I want to sit down, and what does a trials bike not have? A seat. Yeah, so, yeah, it's bad times. So we had somebody else do that video. But I still ride that bike. I like it. Erica rode it. Yeah. It was pretty fun. Yeah, I also rode with, uh, with Andre. Oh, you rode with Andre, too? Yeah. yeah. Not nearly as good a coach as me. <laughs> it's, it's very different. It's, it's very different. different. No, I'm just I'm just being mean. Because I'm always mean. Okay, Paul Van Hoot has a question. Um, More great decision discussion on rider balance and bike setup. Now I have to remember to apply more lessons. Interested in classes up here in Washington or later in the fall down in Nevada when the Pacific Northwest rains and chills is upon us. Yeah, Paul, um, uh, thanks for that. Yeah, we do offer a riding school. Or you can go to Moto Ventures. <laughs> I think they're probably they're up and running already. I don't know. I'm, uh, yeah, so uh, I always think uh, if you're going to spend time working on your riding and training, it's going to be good time. So, uh, pretty good. Infa infamously unknown. Black helmets getting hotter than others is a myth. Helmets are foam inlined like a cooler. The interior temperature is controlled by your own temperature. Same as every color. The exterior of a black helmet might get a little warmer than the white helmet, but it does not affect the interior. Logan, you're going to have to plug your ears for a second. Science, motherfucker. Do you believe it? Okay, put your, put your earphones back on. Um, okay, so uh, you did say a couple things that were true, uh, infamously unknown. Uh, you probably like to remain that way at this point. Um, and uh, boy, Martin Hackworth. Uh, would have a field day on you right now. I and, and I think you, the reason he brought this up is because I talked about I wear a black helmet a lot, uh, mostly for photos and other times because it's the first one that I grab and I just put it on my helmet and I go, is your black, black car hotter than the white one when you leave it in the parking lot? Um, how many black coolers do you see on the market? It, yeah, for sure, the outer surface temperature of black will get hotter and it will radiate its way into the helmet, even though you have a foam cooler-like material going between there. And w I think once you get going and start moving, it, yeah, I, dude, Martin, come to my rescue here. To, like, to give this guy a lesson. I'm not a th physicist. I don't, I don't know it, but... Uh, Yes, black helmets are hotter. I will tell you that I can feel it when I when I ride. And the peanut gallery has something to say. Bob, you raised your hand. 100 degrees on a white helmet is 160 on a black helmet. But more importantly, the EPS liner, the white foam liner, right. is getting really soft at 160. Right. Well, that may be good or bad. No, it's bad. Are you sure? Absolutely. Well, it depends on how hard you're going to hit your head on the ground. It it's, does. It's, I'll argue on that it's, one. It's collapsing. Yeah, I know it's collapsing. So you have less... But you know, it's time distance for energy attenuation. Yeah. And you're running out of distance. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But you might you might have a slow speed impact where the, the stiffness of your particular helmet liner might be too stiff and that might actually benefit you. Uh, well, I, I, I always go down to tell me how you're gonna crash and I'll tell you which helmet to wear. <laughs> but until you can tell me how you're gonna crash, just buy a really good safe helmet. Um and probably uh, not a one that has 160 degrees into the foam. So yeah, you're right. I'll 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 eat it on that one. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, where were we? What? Where, how do we go off on that vector? 
It does. It does change. Yeah. Well, so the other thing, how many black airplanes do you see? Those ones that just sit out in the sun all the time? Black plastic ones. <laughs> Not very many black plastic ones? None. None. <laughs> Yeah, and hey, you know if it if it uh, yeah if it flies, it's got to be a little bit safer than what we do. Um, next, David Nitson wants some names of what he wants to buy something, and he wants names so we know who not to buy from. Um, <laughs> okay, I, I'll I'll yeah if, if I have an idea, I'll give it to you. I don't know what we're talking about. Um, Hagard, sixty nine. I'm 26. Yeah, Pigard, he's he's a regular. Yeah, Paul. Yes. Paul up in Reno. Uh, hey, Jimmy, Paul up in Reno again. Like I said. <laughs> I'm on the fence with Climb Mojave Pants. Summer is, as you know, can be hot in the Great Basin. Oh, it's not that hot up there. You guys are on a field day. That's It's hot down here. I still need a solid pants that will... Shed wind for the cooler months. I ride the most, most in cooler months and winter. Will the Mojave pants be reasonable in the stupid hot months to realistically make them 12 months pants? Thanks okay. Thanks for your insight. Yeah, in your moderate weather up there in Reno. Uh, <laughs> it gets cold. Oh, it gets cold, but uh, moderate in heat um, compared to here. So he's asking the difference between, well, he's asking about the Mojave pants. And Mojave is Climb's very vented pant. And so vented, it sometimes doesn't feel like you're wearing a pant. If I were up in, in Reno, I would be wearing the Dakar pant. And the reason I would wear it is because it has a, the other thing it has is it has a big vent that goes all the way down the front of your thigh. And you can zip that thing down and it's literally as vented as you can get in that zone. And that's generally enough to to compensate where the the Mojave the Mojave might be vented a little bit more in the knee or up on the waist, and it it would it would be a um, in other words it would go from a from a three to four month pant up in Reno to a twelve month pant by going to the Dekar in my honest opinion, um, and then even down here sometimes especially when I'm moving at higher speeds I wear the Dekar over the Mojave because like if it's really vented and you sweat the sweat goes away so quick it doesn't kind of do its job as well and you can almost dehydrate so i can kind of tune i can tune the amount of venting i get by adjusting that zipper you know up or down and then you know when i go riding i always get stuck out late at night and then i freeze my ass off in my uh mojave when i would be better off on the dakar uh, peanut gallery, Bob. I just try to avoid black pants. Avoid the, black pants. In the summer, for the yeah, summer. avoid the black pants. Uh, good, good comment. Uh, but unfamously unknown does not agree with you. He's going to go black all day long. Okay. Um, Mike Shirley. Mike Shirley. Second best. Is that, is that name? Does that name sound familiar, Logan? Yes. Yeah, yeah. He's your replacement. You better <laughs> read this up real quick. Um, second best co-host ever. Logan is number. Number uno. Yeah. Um, Mike uh, felt he, he realized he had some big shoes to fill over there sitting in your seat. He was the co-host on uh, Tech Talk Taco Tuesday number 70. Um, so, yeah. Living the dream, right, Logan? Yeah. Okay, next question. Taylor C4. Do you like this guy? From what I've learned, not so much. But <laughs> Logan's call-in KTM Reed is a F. Plus, pick it up, buddy. You're slacking. Logan, you got an F plus on that KTM read. You need to practice. <laughs> What's coming up next week? Probably a without look read. Okay, got it. Yeah, just just keep up on that. <laughs> you, you like the plus? An F is an F. The plus doesn't count. <laughs> Liberty Tree have worn climb for years. They also support the Black Backcountry Discovery Route organiza Organization. Man, I wish my doctor called me with questions about dirt bike clutches. 
Um, uh, I called in with a question about, I wish my doctor call. Oh yeah. My doc, did my doctor call the show last time? How did that, how did that come in? You talked about him. I talked about my doctor calling in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, My doctor calls me with the bike advice and I call him with medical advice. So, um, you just got to find a better doctor, man. There's a lot of doctors that ride dirt bikes and there's, it's funny because Gardner, Gardner Tarlow, who's my doctor, uh, I, I used to ride with his brother. We used to race Saturday motocross at Carlsbad all the time and uh, with Garth Tarlow. And then I'm, I'm through him, I met Gardner, who uh, was more of a trail rider. And uh, we become really good friends. And uh, it's funny because he, he always, it, and this is what I really like about him, he steps back and even when I'm asking him to, for something stupid, like I know I've hurt myself or whatever, he steps back and he always does what really good doctors do. There's what they call a standard of care. And it doesn't matter that I'm Jimmy Lewis or I'm anybody else or whatever. It's like, this is the way that me as a doctor would recommend you to get better, heal, take this procedure and stuff like that. And I've always respected that. And and but since he knows I'm an idiot and I'm a dirt bike rider and he's also a dirt bike rider and he says, but I know you're going to go ride anyway. So, <laughs> so, so here's and Jimmy's like laughing right now. <laughs> a guy has been through a little bit of doctors lately. The other Jimmy that's in the house, um, he, you know, but he kind of he kind of understands he, he he gets it. But at the same time, he doesn't step back from what he, he really just like when I give you an answer on this podcast in dirt bikes in general, it's like, I, I know this, this is what I, what I do. And I want to give you the best advice that, that I can. And I have to, even if it goes beyond what maybe a sponsor would want me to say, or what the internet tells you. Oh, that's what I always like, you know, if you, you don't even need a doctor anymore, just go on the doctor md.com and then get the best advice you can and then spend the money to go into a doctor and then tell them what you read on the internet and, and get, get your, you know, cause why, why bother even going there? And that's what I like about this show too, because people tell me what they read in the internet and they come and ask me. And then I'm like, uh, well, you know, you, the reason you threw that in front of me with that question is cause you, you just wanted to start an argument. So, um, uh, I'm not, a, I have to make a statement now, Logan. I'm not a doctor and I don't even play one on TV. Yep. <laughs> okay. <Holiday Inn. laughs> what was that? Holiday Inn. Holiday Inn, doctor? Do they stay at Holiday Inn? There's something about that, right? I don't I didn't yeah. haven't been watching TV enough. Um TTT number seventy. Right. CRF two fifty L. Curtis E. Style over performance is the two fifty CC comparing it to the 450 rally or adventure bikes 600 cc and over waste of my time not watching this channel again oh um <laughs> he's talking about our cr250 hell video because we spent a lot of time um comparing it to we're talking about like if there were a 450 rally or if there were a larger displacement bike or how does it compare to a 600 or whatever and i'm glad you wasted your time and i hope that you come back to listen to this um, explanation because the reason we spent time talking about that on that video is because those were the type of questions that we got. How does this 250cc bike compare to this? Or should I get this or a bigger bike? And that's how we answered those questions. So uh, I'm uh, glad you wasted your time on us. Just uh, keep clicking away. More eyeballs, better views. Um, Mark Lewis. Again? <laughs> Same question, except for the last bit, which he says, keto diets and excite bike. Oh, no. Video no. Games. <laughs> yeah, no, that's why I, I threw that in there. So, um, uh, Mark Lewis. Yeah, he, no, 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 no. Mark, oh, which one? I, oh boy. I'm confused now. What's the, what's read the next question from, uh, Brian Walker. Um, please reply about why do you think Hondas don't put a, 300 cc or a 350 cc into a bike they knew full well would be underpowered for its weight it's just that they took the very much 
underpowered, underpowered wimpy, wimpy Honda 230. And upgraded it a bit. Um, I don't think Honda is into playing games, but shouldn't they have called the 250 rally a two, 220 or 200 so people were excited about the power <laughs> instead of disappointment, even though they might have sold a few less? I know that you can't please everybody, but there really should be a strongly powered 200 and very nicely powered 300, or, not a wimpy two thir- 250 in the middle. <laughs> Brian, you need to work in a marketing department so you can get fired. <laughs> yeah, you have, yeah, you have no idea. <laughs> oh, um, that... That just brings me on to this thing is like when somebody makes a comment like that, they have no idea on what is going on in the background. And I just saw someplace, I saw somebody do a long explanation on why KTM is making an 890. And, you know, because there's a 790 and now there will be 890s adventures and stuff coming out. And and actually, it was Kevin Cameron from Cycle World. And do yourself a favor and search Kevin Cameron on Cycle World and read his stuff. That guy is legend. And I got to work with him when I was at Cycle World. And when all these other people are going, oh, yeah, 890, it's going to be this and that and other stuff. Kevin breaks it down and tells you why it's an 890, and he nails it. It's because with this Euro 5 standards and emission standards, you can't get the same power out of the same displacement as you used to. And there's things that have to do with volumetric efficiency and heat transfer and startup cycles and all this stuff that you don't think about, but all of a sudden you go, Oh, this 250 is weak. Oh, uh, yeah. But since you want clean air and you want fuel efficiency, that's what we got. And that's just the way it is. So it's a, it's an interesting dynamic and, so the 250 rally, I bet you I could take an old XR200 and properly set up, it will make the same power as a brand new CRF 250L rally. It's just the way that things are. Is it? Does it vibrate less? No. Is it smoother? No. Would I want that XR200 motor in that 250 rally chassis because it maybe makes a little more power? No. Because that that Honda is so drivable, so easy to ride, the bike fits what it's supposed to be doing. Um, so no, they shouldn't call it a two twenty. So you hop on it and go, wow, this thing actually feels like a a two thirty, even though it's a two fifty. It's yeah. it's you're at that point you're just kind of playing games. They call it what it is. At least <laughs> in Honda's defense, they don't make a, a you know. A, What's the, I, I, and I'm drawing a blank for displacements. KTM is famous for just putting a number on the side panel mm-hmm. and making the motor whatever the heck they want. My Husaberg 570 is not a 570. A 500 is not a 500. A 500 is not a 500. It's a 510, isn't it? 530? No, it's something less than that. It's less than 500. Yeah. I should look at the displacement. Isn't there specifications someplace I could look at? If I had a good producer of this show, they would be feeding me information in one ear right now. And saying, Jimmy, shut up. You're going to trip over your whatever. But the, the the don't don't get too worried about the numbers. And, yeah, it's 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 underpowered uh, for what a 250 could be. But it's um, it does it does its job. And uh, what's a KTM 390? It's a 372. You're getting cheated. You're getting cheated like uh, how many? Do the math, Logan, quick. 390 to 372. That's um, 12? 18. 18. That's right. 18 cc's KTM's cheating you based on the sticker on the side panel. Should you get a refund for that? No. No. <laughs> okay, next question. Um Skip Walker. Oh, this is the one. This is the this is what that quote uh, comes from. So go read this one. When I'm, you, just, I'm gonna have a little sip right over here. When you keep saying entry level and beginner, the I know you are being paid to say what you say. You're running motorcycles for everyone, ruining motorcycles for everybody. When you are this discriminative, discriminative. Yeah, that's, that's the word you used. You should be banned from motorcycle journalism. Not everyone wants to operate at 300%. 
we need to see things and experience them. So if you must be little be little people who want to explore the world at the enjoyable play pace. Say it like you say say it like you wrote it. Piss off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he listened to me. Oh, I lo- mean Logan? Logan doesn't listen to me. Uh, <laughs> so Skip Walker, uh, boy, I had to. I had to. I you know, I, I you know what I you know what I enjoy doing on Tuesday afternoon before I get ready for the show. I like going on YouTube's and just just getting just completely demoralized by you know people like this that are just poking sharp sticks at me, but. Uh, guess what? I have a podcast and you don't, and I'm going to say what I think and you can't defend yourself. <laughs> so here we go. Um, entry level and beginner are very, very, very extremely important segments in the motorcycle community. If we didn't have those two segments and we didn't identify them as a certain segment for somebody that doesn't know what they're doing and listen to the beginning of this podcast when I really went into depth explaining something that's common to us that have been in for a while, but new to someone's new. I like entry level and beginner because that's a place to start. That's where you start. You don't start in the pro class. So they're important market segments to bring people in. So we have motorcycling so we can grow with it. So there's where it's a feeding frenzy. And because once you get into dirt bikes and I'm just speaking for myself, I got addicted and I don't want to turn back. I really enjoy riding dirt bikes, riding motorcycles. It's fun. It's not discriminatory. It's not, it's, I'm not getting paid to say that. And nobody, nobody gave me a call sheet and said, you have to say beginner and paid, uh, you, you know, no. Um, I agree with you. Motorcycling is for everyone. And I think we're just coming from two different sides. And here's, here's where I think it, it struck a nerve with you is that, that we call the KTM 390, a, you know, entry level, beginner level bike. It is, that's what it's targeted for, especially for a brand like KTM that's known for making ready to race motorcycles. They actually struggled with deciding how they were going to come off that pedestal and build motorcycles for everyone. They wanted to bring that 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 race feeling, that race heritage, that race image that they have down to the entry level or beginner level bike. And you know, it's like that that's that's what it is. Now, that's not to say that I don't know and and have friends that that isn't a great bike for them. You know, it, whether they're that, whether they've been riding for 40 years, like I, I always think of Crazy Nate. I could put Crazy Nate on that bike. And I, there was a few years ago he wanted to buy an adventure bike just to ride back and from Pahrump back to his house in Lake Isabella when he comes out and helps us at our schools. He was looking for a bike, and we just couldn't find one that was – He's also riding one of those detuned Honda 230s, like literally a 230, not the even the 250. But it's 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 a it's a segment that's a viable segment. But the 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 um, the advantage or the and I don't even call it an advantage, just the the side effect of making bikes like that is they fit a lot of people. Maybe people that don't have the 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 inseam length to touch the ground, even if it is one inch less than mine and I can flat foot pretty easily. And I don't know where the 300% comes in. Did, are we riding that bike at 300% in the video? I don't think so. <laughs> um, but I'm not belittling anybody who wants to explore the world at an enjoyable pace in your words. Um, some people actually take a motorcycle and they don't ride it at a race level. We didn't test that bike at a race level. We tested it. We tested it at a level way beyond where it was designed to, but we also tested it for the most part, what it was designed to be used for. And I, yeah. I beg you to go and look at other reviews and see how they tested it. And they're going to use the same words because as motorcycle journalists, you have to be kind of aware of where everything's at, but we spent a lot of time, you know, putting people on it. I put, well, Janie, um, my bartender, I was like call her my bartender. Uh, <laughs> Janie's a good friend of mine. And she's a Harley rider. Doesn't really have a, I mean, she'd like to ride off road, but it's very intimidating for her. I said, hey, Janie, hop in this thing. She took it and rode around like a street bike. She went in these long, she went and rides it. She would take her Harley on. She said, well, it's not as good as the Harley for doing that, but man, it's actually pretty easy to ride and it's fun. And she wants to take it out. And now all of a sudden she wants to go down dirt roads. 
you, you know, it was it was the bridge because we put her on dirt bikes before and they were scary. They the dirt bikes were just too much, but that bike all of a sudden she felt comfortable on it. So it does its job and she's been riding for a long time. And so this entry level bike was a a gap into, you know, riding dirt bikes and adventure bikes. So something to think about um if you're uh, if you're into that. Um oh yeah, and uh so Skip Walker who's preaching keto diets and uh Video uh, excite bike video games and telling us that we don't know how to test. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I did go look at his profile to figure out what he was all about because I when when he said little people, I thought maybe I offended like little people, like you know Erica. Oh wait, did I say that out loud? <laughs> yeah, five. Yeah, the five five. Yeah. Hey, you know, is, is, we got another page, don't we? God, where's where, where's there was the question about the tall people? Oh, I that, yeah. If you feel if you feel slighted as a as a little person or a small person or someone that's small and having a hard time with motorcycles, imagine if you're a big dude like that six four or six eight guy, you're really screwed. Because at least as a smaller person, there's there's there there's it's funny because. When we get into the smaller size motorcycle, there's like kind of this weird gap that exists, you know, going from you know, like kids' bikes. Oh, I'm, now I'm classifying things again. <laughs> Sorry. You know, going from kids' bikes to adults' bikes. You know, there's this gap where it's kind of hard to find something and you want a performance like bike and maybe you're a smaller rider and you're coming off of a, a big wheel 85 or, or you know, some sort of a KLX, uh, uh, KLX 125 or a TTR 125 or a CRF 150 and you want to go to the next step. And and size wise, at least there's some gaps in there. There's some there's some stepping stones, but if you're coming off of a, let's just say YZ85, you, you know this, and going to YZ125, that's a yeah. big jump. Yeah. But we all had to do it. I mean, when I was racing, that's what I did. You know, I went from an eighty an eighty to a one twenty five, and it's you're going from small bike to full size bike. But if all of a sudden you grow and you end up being six foot eight, and then you go looking for a motorcycle, you're screwed. They don't make that bike for you. Then and you can't buy an extra large frame like you can on a mountain bike mm -hmm. and all this stuff. So if you're gonna get upset like, you know, rolling back to like little people or you know, smaller people, uh I feel for the big people because you don't have a motorcycle. So um <laughs> hey Skip, thanks for reaching out. I, I I did reply to your comment and tried to explain what I just said in uh in some other words. So, uh, yeah, good. What's our, let's, let's get to the end of this thing. Let's finish this show up. Um, 450 on board. Oh, um, Paul Savos. Is this Logan? Oh yeah. yeah so there's, so the, he's, uh, so Trevor Hunter made a video of our YZ 450 when we were out testing at Glen Helen and he asked if it was you, was it you? No, no. Cause why not? Because you couldn't go? You don't want to ride a 450? What's the story? Wasn't in Glen Helen? No, you weren't in Glen Helen. But, you know, it's it's pretty flattering to think that somebody thought that that was you because, you know, Trevor hauls ass. Yeah. He goes pretty good. Yeah, he, he's out of balance all the time. I tell him that, but it's, uh, we're trying to, we're trying to work on that. 